On the Edge of History presents Field Trip. He was a simple farmer who helped plant the seeds of a counterculture revolution in America. His parents were Jewish immigrants from Belarus who started a dairy farm shortly after they arrived in America in the early 1900s. He and his younger brother Isidore helped with the daily chores on the farm. Up before sunrise, cleaning the beds, milking the cows, feeding and checking on the young and sick cows. Then, after a full day at school, he would do it all over again. They also ran a small hotel on the property, so throw in a few more daily chores like making beds, cleaning rooms, and delivering meals to guests. The work never ended. But the young, enterprising man thrived. Smart and ambitious, he attended New York University, where he studied agriculture and real estate law with an eye on expanding the family farm. Um, when his father died in 1927, he took over the family business and purchased two more farms nearby to increase their grazing area. In the mid-1950s, he brought a radical innovation to the property, installing a state-of-the-art plant designed to be operated by one person that could pasteurize, bottle, and refrigerate milk of his cows as well as make other dairy products like sour cream and chocolate milk. By the 1960s, his farm business had grown to be the largest milk producer in the county. He and his wife Mimi had raised two children, a boy and a girl, who had worked on the family farm before moving to New York City, where his son became the assistant district attorney. He was an active member of the community, spearheading the creation of a local airport, and was president of the Lions Club. He was also involved in Jewish charities and a congregant of the Liberty Street Synagogue. Most important to our story was his non-judgmental attitude towards people. He often hired people without regard to their ethnicity, their religion, or their political leanings. There were often people working on the farm that were on parole or probation. He believed that everyone deserved a chance. He even gave second chances to those who deserved it. And so that's why when organizers for a music festival were banned by the neighboring city council because they were hippies, it was only natural that Max Yesker from nearby Bethel, New York, would offer his farm for the Woodstock Music and Art Festival in 1969. Five weeks before the scheduled festival dates, when Woodstock Ventures, Inc., were officially banned from holding the concert in Wachill, a local real estate agent put them in touch with Max Yasker, whose farm was the perfect fit. The farm had plenty of ample acreage and was laid out like a sloping bowl, forming a natural amphitheater. He was paid $50,000 for the use of his 600 acres of land, though reports on that exact sum differ. Before he accepted, however, he wanted to be sure that the civic officials, many were his friends and business associates. He wanted to make sure that they agreed with his plan. Well, he was disappointed that they had the same attitude as Wachill. They didn't want thousands of hippies descending on their small town. He responded, so the only objection to having a festival here is keeping long hairs out of town. Well, you could all go pound salt because come August 15th, we're going to have a festival. The resentment from neighbors never subsided. Prior to the Woodstock Festival, signs were erected around town saying, Stop Max's Hippie Music Festival. No 150,000 hippies here. And don't buy Yasker's milk. He loves hippies. They tried to change his mind. They made threatening phone calls. They organized boycotts. They came to his farm to try to talk him out of it. And in the end, their negative attitude 
only hardened his resolve. Yasker also believed strongly in freedom of expression and was angered by the hostility of some townspeople toward anti-war hippies. Hosting the festival became for him a cause. He was determined to see the festival become a success. And they had planned for about 50,000 people. But when 400,000 showed up a day early and started setting up on their farm, Yasker couldn't believe his eyes. He said at the time that he never expected the festival to be so large. He immediately could sense difficulties awaiting such a massive crowd and told his workers to fill every empty glass jar in the plant with water. He supplied meals at cost or at no charge. He even spoke to the huge crowd on Sunday afternoon. I think you people have proven something to the world. This is the largest group of people ever assembled in one place. The important thing that you've proven to the world is that half a million kids, and I call you kids because I have children that are older than you, a half million young people can get together and have three days of fun and music and have nothing but fun and music. And I, God bless you for it. His speech was met with a massive cheer from the audience. And following Woodstock, many people in the community turned against Yasker. He was sued by his neighbors for property damage caused by concert attendees. He was not welcomed in the town's general store. His neighbors continued the boycott of his milk. When thousands and thousands of letters arrived from appreciative concert goers and families searching for lost children arrived at the local post office, the postmaster refused to deliver them. So Max Yasker simply changed his mailing address to the next county. Suffering from heart disease and encouraged to retire by his doctor, Max Yasker sold his dairy farm in 1971, only two years after Woodstock. He moved to Florida and suffered a massive heart attack. Two years later, he died at the age of 53. Despite everything that he went through, Max Yasker never regretted hosting Woodstock. At the time he said, if the generation gap is to be closed, we older people have to do more than we've done. By opening his heart and offering his field to Woodstock, Max Yasker made sure that a counterculture milestone happened at the right time and in the right place. He lived an ordinary life until history gave him a supporting role, an extraordinary event. <laughs>